So I'm Dr. Maya Shimunyak. I'm a researcher at Middlesex University, London. Uh, before coming into academia, I worked as a journalist in broadcast and in print, so magazines and daily newspapers, for just under a decade. Um, I am one of those who have left the newsroom, uh, not for many of the reasons we've heard today. I was working in sports and travel and lifestyle, so I wasn't exposed to a lot of the stressors that others have in daily news. Uh, for me personally, it was the relentless 24-7 since the age of 16. So by the time I was 25, I was, I want a weekend off. And I found that not necessarily immediately in academia, but it develops as the time goes on. Um, now, I think what I'm going to talk about and we're going to talk about in this session really ties nicely to the last question that was discussed in the panel. So what can be done? And um, you will see some similarities in the things that we're going to discuss to some of the stuff that was uh, said before. But I am actually looking at um, newsrooms from a bit of a different perspective. So I'm not focusing on trauma and, and kind of covering conflict. I entered this field looking at journalistic labor in general. Um, and in that case, I was, I'm, I was kind of focusing on journalists' everyday labor, kind of the almost mundane things that happen in the journalistic process. So um, in this session, we will kind of focus on support systems for journalists' well-being. And I'll try and explain, explain why I'm talking about well-being rather than specifically mental health. Um, and we're going to examine some of the data that I've collected over the past few years about British journalists' labor, because I'm primarily looking at journalism in the UK, their emotional labor, um, their perceptions of available support, and some of their suggestions for improvement in this support. And I'm hoping this is going to be uh, at least slightly interactive uh, session. I have some data to show you, but I also have a couple of reflective brainstorming activities that you can perhaps, that can give you a bit of time to reflect on what you've heard and see how you can uh, use the information. So just to kind of establish what we're talking about here, because we're slightly moving away from talking about covering traumatic um, events, can I ask you to take a minute just to note if you've ever felt, or if you're a manager, if you think that your staff ever feels any of these things. If you're not excited about covering a big story or event, you're in the wrong job. <laughs> I get every day of my career out all of that. <laughs> and, and that's the reply I usually get when I ask uh, journalists this, but you can see their faces kind of wondering whether it's good that they're hitting all eight or they're in trouble in some way. And the reason I, I put these is because this is what I call the usual suspects. And um, I was just uh, talking to James and Hannah and I was telling them when I interviewed British journalists, because I was kind of focusing on emotions and journalism in general, my opening question would be, you know, do you ever experience any kind of emotions while you do your job? And the first answer was usually no. And then you ask a couple of sub questions and then it was like, oh, all of them actually. But it, it, it's a normal part of the process, but the word emotion in journalism has been almost banned up until a couple of years ago. So my interest is kind of what, the, what is the role of emotions in journalists labor? And we said the word emotion a couple of times. I want to kind of specify what kind of emotions um, is emotional labor focusing on. So I'm not an expert in psychiatry or psychology, but I think it's useful to think of emotions perhaps at kind of three basic levels. At one level, you may be experiencing an emotion and not even be aware of it. You know, if it's not something that you have a physical reaction to, if you're slightly anxious, if you're, you know, you're smiling at something, but you're not really happy. So it's not even registering with you. Then you may be experiencing an emotion, but you don't feel the need to manage it. Maybe you are at home and your story 
is going viral on social media and everybody is saying, well done, you probably won't need to curb this emotion. You're going to go, yeah, I'm so happy that this is happening. If you're a manager and your team does really well, you're going to show them how proud you are. And then there's the third level of emotions and they're those that you recognize that are happening or sometimes they're subconscious, but you can see that your body is reacting to them and you feel the need to manage them in order to be able to continue doing your job. So in journalism, these would be things where you think you need to hide your emotions. For example, I'm not going to cry in front of a grieving mother. I'm not going to shake in front of a politician, although I really feel like shaking and I'm scared to ask a question. It can be the need to suppress your emotions because you just cannot deal with it right now or any kind of other reaction to kind of trying to regulate those emotions so you can feel better and you can continue doing your job. So what I'm interested in is this role of emotions in journalism and particularly the emotional challenges <laughs> of working in journalism. And colleagues across the world have observed that journalism has always been, and because of the processes of digitalization and globalization, is now increasingly a high emotional labor job. Now, importantly, that there is evidence to suggest that work-related emotional pressures are correlated with a range of negative effects, including poor well-being, impaired physical and mental health, decreased job satisfaction, work commitment, and in the end, quality of journalism. Given how many people we've seen today here who have left journalism, it speaks a bit uh, to that issue. And given all of this, um, it might, you might expect that there are kind of well-developed and structured workplace support systems in place to assist journalists with all this labor, as we've heard today and as all of my data and those from uh, colleagues across the world shows, there is really very little. So there are scientific studies done. So some of the stuff that I've done, and I have data from Germany, US, and Australia, and all of the evidence points to the fact that journalists are usually left to their own devices when they're facing um, a stressor or an emotional situation. <coughs> so this presentation, uh, together with, uh, I'm hoping, some interaction, we're going to try and discuss three quick three key questions. And this is how do British, and you know, I say British journalists from the entire UK, perceive support when dealing with potentially problematic emotional labor? How do they see the support systems being improved to better safeguard their, their well-being? And how can their psychological capital or personal resource, resources be enhanced? And these are some of the kind of key concepts that I think we need to have in mind. A lot of these we have already kind of talked about today in some shape or form, but kind of before we go and try and answer the questions, I think we need to understand what are the key issues and how they're interrelated. There is evidence that the, these three key elements are related. So emotional labor, workplace well-being, and support systems. So emotional labor is understood as the effort that workers, so it's, it's a sociological concept that specifically refers to uh, emotions that are experienced in work. So emotional labor is the effort that workers need to employ when they're experiencing work-related emotions in order to manage them. Now, these emotional pressures could be seen as a stressor which influences workplace well-being. Now, the definitions of work, workplace well-being vary, but in general, they refer to physical and mental health uh, combined with satisfaction with social networks, processes, and practices in the workplace. So it's kind of a, a holistic view of how someone feels um, within a workplace. And the existing research suggests that effective support systems, so the third element, can mitigate the negative effects of the emotional labor and in that, and that, and in that way increase uh, workplace well-being. The organizational psychology literature commonly speaks of these three pillars of support. 
So we have the personal resources. So for example, resilience, emotional intelligence, hope, optimism. So I'm going to refer to them later on as psychological capital. Then there are organizational and social support. Perceived organizational support. Um, that is, I, we, you'll see that we have referenced it throughout today. It refers to workers' perception of the extent to which the employer cares about their well-being um, and uh, values their contributions. It is usually influenced by the relationship with the supervisor. We have heard about supervisors quite a lot today. They are one of the central aspects in support <coughs> systems. But also things like opportunities for training and development, recognition of accomplishment, and quite importantly, having fair and transparent procedures and policies. And social support is usually defined as support from peers. I'm not going to bore you with this, but just kind of so you have a sense of where the data is coming from. There are two key data sets. Uh, one are interviews with British journalists, including those from Northern Ireland. And the other are workshops with journalism trainees and professionals. Both of them have been done uh, throughout the UK. In the interviews with British journalists, I tried to understand what causes emotional labor in their work. And that was like an open question. So whatever they talked about, I listened to. And what do they do to manage? So what kind of strategies do they employ in order to be able to manage uh, that labor, <laughs> together with their perception of the support systems and, and what they would like to get from that. And I'll tell you more about the workshops in a second, because I want to get to the findings. You won't be surprised that in line with the trends uh, kind of observed in other journalistic cultures and markets, Journalists, after a bit of prompting, uh, reported experiencing a variety of forms of emotional labor. So from the kind of the expected stressors of the trauma and conflict reporting that we've heard about today, to the challenges that everyday work poses. So dealing with sources and interviewees, writing about controversial or sensitive topics, chasing deadlines, working long hours, the, this, the inability to disconnect from digital devices, dealing with online abuse and so on. And that is kind of on a daily basis all the time. Thinking of the support systems, and this is across like all of the research that was done on journalistic everyday labor, journalists regularly say that their personal resources, their psychological capital is the only reliable thing that they can kind of fall back on when they're experiencing hardship. So, Personal resources are deemed as the most um, important pillar of support. And it was interesting, kind of more senior journalists who have been in the field for a long time, they often speak of developing particularly resilience, kind of with experience. You know, it happens, it's, it stopped bothering me. But when, whenever I asked, well, how did you develop it? They were sure they have it, but they couldn't really verbally express or conceptualize how did they get there. And also, they assumed that nowadays, journalism trainees, they, they must be trained in this. So journalism schools nowadays obviously train young journalists in this, which is actually very rarely the case. But whether those new to the industry or those who have been in the industry for a long time, there was a very clear call for more support for journalists to develop personal resources. Next, social support. Um, it has been described as very important, very effective, but also depending on the newsroom structure and culture. So some British journalists um, spoke very highly about their peers and kind of being able to rely on them. But this wasn't the case in all newsrooms. And actually, um, some British journalists spoke about newsroom culture not being as collegiate as they would want it to be and said that they cannot or would not go to their peers for support. Some of them spoke, and we heard this word um, already, about the macho culture in journalism. Um, and these are kind of based on the narratives of having thick skin, 
not acknowledging that everyday labor, kind of working 12 hours or not having a free day or, you know, you, you come back to work one day, you haven't been uh, on for two days and you're expected to know everything that was happening. So you kind of, you constantly have to be in, um, plugged into the, the, the news cycle. And there is kind of no recognition of that kind of a labor. So this um, early career journalist says, if you do share emotion and if you're affected by something, then you're somehow a bad journalist. We need to do the opposite of that and, you know, talk about the things that so we can deal with them. And I think it's a sentiment that we have heard um, today as well. There was also a clear call for a change of the journalistic culture. Uh, and I think that, that was also a point that was made um, in the panel previously. And it was said that it should be based on both journalists and their editors or bosses acknowledging the emotional strain of the profession and as was mentioned before creating spaces in which social support is readily given and received so this mid-career editor says maybe from both sides you know reporters need to be maybe a bit more kind to colleagues but also maybe editors to not push that mentality downwards as well on an organizational level, um, in the UK, particularly journalists from larger newsrooms talked about human resources and the actions of human resources. And there were a couple of particularly useful things that they find, find in um, these kinds of support systems. So uh, private health plans that include counseling, um, offers of seminars, access to well-being apps, they recognize this. And many were aware of the HR's kind of well-being initiatives, but they were often described as corporate box ticking and not particularly useful. There was this conversation running through through the day, kind of people not people not from journalism not really understanding what journalists need in order to be supported. Relationship with the supervisor, very, very important, and I'll say more about it in a second. And again, a very clear call for organizational support for training, which would equip both editors and journalists with skills to better cope with the emotional strain in the job. And here, I, I think all four of our guests in the panel previously said that managers are really, really important and they need more skills and time in order to provide this kind of support. So I presented some of this, these findings last year at the event organized by the European Federation of Journalists and there were representatives of the journalistic unions from across Europe. And when I said that one of the things that journalists are calling for are their editors having more emotional intelligence, there was a spontaneous applause in the room with like, yes, <laughs> we didn't think of it ourselves, but yes, that is exactly what we're talking about. So in terms of uh, supervisors, there weren't many journalists who praised them. There were some, but it was clear that those journalists who were praising their supervisors or bosses had a friendship with them. It wasn't just a, a, a collegial kind of workplace uh, relationship. And I guess I can try and speculate that perhaps the editors in the UK don't feel the same level of responsibility towards their staff because they can see the HR taking point when it comes to well-being. But that doesn't mean the journalists are not feeling frustrated or unsupported because of their relationship with the bosses. Uh, this mid-career journalist says, maybe there's just a culture of um, bullying might be too strong of a word for it, but I think there's a culture of it's favorites who get asked questions or have close relationships. And actually, well-being isn't about, you know, your friendship with the boss. It's about, you know, uh, we've heard the, this already today, somebody asking you, are you okay? How are you? How was that? And from the collections that I've heard, it's mostly kind of, if you have a friendly relationship with the supervisor, that you will get that kind of an attention. Um, British journalists spoke of the need for an introduction of an institutionalized pastoral care role within newsrooms. And this is what we've been discussing previously. It's something that I've heard uh, is happening in Netherlands and uh, in, in Nigeria, I think as well. In the US, there are some pilot uh, programs. 
And the point is that they want somebody to be tasked with proactive care for their well-being, but this not being their editor, because journalists say that they don't have enough emotional intelligence to even recognize why they're struggling, and they're the ones who are giving them all of the tasks that are leading to their burnout. And it shouldn't be HR, because they just don't speak the language. They don't understand when to offer support or in what kind of a shape or form. And this is a condensed quote, but um, this senior editor was very specific on what she wants. And she says, this may be an impossible dream, but somebody who understands the way in which news operates, ways journalists work, the pressures that we're under, but has enough emotional intelligence to have a conversation with you that's more informed than, than that of your line managers, who who's just a former journalist who's been promoted into being a manager. And that's that problem of middle management that isn't, I think, specific to journalism. In sum, the key recommendations for improved support um, as defined by the journalists. In order to kind of normalize the discussion of emotional pressures in the industry, it is suggested that journalism should be positioned as a high emotional labor job as early as in training. So not to rom romanticize it too much, but to say it as it is from the start. Um, and that trainees should start developing personal resources for managing emotional labor alongside the basic journalistic skills. In the newsrooms, uh, to develop fair and transparent um, organizational support systems, to organize support for development of personal resources for managing emotional challenges, to create and support proactive strategies. And debriefing has been uh, mentioned quite often, but briefings are quite important as well. So if you're sending someone out to have a quick conversation with them, this is what you might expect, because you're better prepared to deal with something if you know what's coming at you. So they spoke both about briefings and debriefings. Um, and just kind of a lot of journalists said that they want proactive help. Because it's still a difficult conversation to make, it's quite difficult for journalists to kind of, well, I have a problem. Can you help me? That's why they want proactive support, because a lot of them won't recognize what's happening. Or they will need a lot of time to actually seek support. But if you have somebody who is proactively engaging with you, you're more likely to get help sooner rather than, la rather than later. Um, and as I said, offer a pastoral care by trained professionals who understand the pressures of the industry. And finally, the industry should do better in acknowledging the everyday emotional labor in the profession. We should be normalizing the conversations about emotional pressure emotional pressures and challenges when doing journalistic work. And with this kind of the implementation of organizational support systems should be an industry standard and not an innovation in certain newsrooms. Now, let's take a breath here. And if you can, if you want to, I'd like you to take a couple of minutes and to think through a couple of these things. So. You, you heard a couple of suggestions. Um, some of them maybe we haven't mentioned today, but a lot of them were kind of running through um, the entire day. And remember that these are not kind of focusing just on trauma in the newsrooms. It's about everyday experience of being a journalist, which I think is quite telling when you see the similarities between, uh, mm -hmm. well, they're not two camps. They're, they overlap quite often. Um, so which of these would you prioritize? If you could, how do you think they might be implemented? Who needs to be on board? And what challenges might you face in setting these structures and processes? I'll just give you maybe a minute or two just to kind of have a think. What I think sort of hasn't been thought about yet, and it's something that I do with John Schofield Chuck, which is mentoring young journalists, is we're not allowed to work with uh, young journalists from our own newsroom. That creates issues if you're creates what we call in the clinical term boundary issues, mm -hmm. everyone can understand boundaries. And so what I thought might be a possibility is the idea of 
the whole industry would have to work together on this and the safe spaces would have to ensure that there were no boundary um, problems with the people that were in the safe spaces. So you wouldn't be in a sharing group with your line manager, you wouldn't be in a sharing group with a journalist that you maybe had the issue with mm -hmm. and that you would have to ensure that the, that the journalists were actually taught about the importance of confidentiality to a clinical to, to a clinical level, mm -hmm. so that it's really really key you understand what clinical boundaries look like and what happens when you mess them up and break them. And I think that's completely missing. So it would have to be if we're going to do something of value that would actually incrementally and would stop all these cups from overflowing, these ropes from breaking, these minds from shattering these bodies from being kind of, you know, storing up all this trauma. As an industry, we would have to all start to understand that the safe spaces would have to, it could only work if we were all prepared to help one another out and ensure that we could do it outside of our organisation with journalists who get it, but not journalists who were perhaps going to be there the next day that we'd have to look in the eye and feel really ashamed of because we were bawling our eyes out or talking about someone that they knew. So I think that's what's maybe missing in mean, the challenges section is mm -hmm. the boundaries in any kind of therapeutic work mm -hmm. are absolutely essential and if they're not right from the beginning then you can actually end up creating more problems than you solve. Mm -hmm. I think that that's really important when journalists want to share something about their team um, in particular but I have a good example I spoke with um, they're like an Instagram only news outlet in Germany. They're associated with the public broadcaster and they have a <coughs> weekly moaning session, but it's, it's the team itself. So they're moaning to one another. I'm pretty sure that some stuff are left out yeah. because of the reasons that you mentioned, but the general feedback is everybody loves it. You know, it's a space where you go and it's structured and that's why it's kind of better than the informal you swivel and now you're swiveling in your flat and there's nobody to swivel to and kind of get that kind of uh, peer support. But that, um, that issue in the organizational support of having fair and transparent fair means that everybody has the opportunity. And if you have a weekly session in which, you know, maybe two people will share, maybe nobody will share, maybe everybody will share. And I've heard there were tears there and sometimes it's just like, oh, I, we don't have the space to do this today. We're not going to do it. But, and, and they go from very basic stuff like, I wanted to tear my hair out uh, because I lost my A-roll yesterday. Or that inch of UE is really getting on my nerves. Like, can somebody else take it? What would you do in that situation? So it can be useful, particularly when we're talking about the daily stuff, kind of, um, which might perhaps appear more mundane, but because of the constant pressure that journalists are under, you know, we have the acute stress, but we also have accrued stress, where you're kind of constantly under stressors which are perhaps not as intense but if you don't vent if you don't share if you don't process it it can accrue and then again lead to burnout or high levels of dissatisfaction there is journalists just with them in the pub that was their safety yeah. valve but you ended up with, a, with a, an industry full of alcoholics yeah. so nothing has replaced that fully yet yeah. we're trying to <laughs> <laughs> and i think one of the challenges there and, and i completely hear what josh and, and james are saying and you know, it's, it's fascinating. Over the last couple of years, I've been facilitating some of these conversations for newsrooms, and literally just people want to be heard. And they literally just want to be able to say, that was a bit, bit of a shitty day. Or they want to be like, hey, it's um, Bob's birthday today. Let's, let's have, we'll celebrate Bob's birthday. It's something like that, you know, it's a collegiate thing. But the challenges wise, is back to that thing that we talked about so much today in terms of newsrooms are being run by the folks who've just had to suck it up. Right? And so they feel like, well, well, why should we create this space if we had it so bad? A little bit like the kind of sex assault stuff. Well, because we used to just grab you on the ass all the time, right? In newsrooms. And, and we have to change it at some stage, like chuck a grenade in, you know? And you've got to chuck a grenade in at some point. That's probably a bad analogy. But um, it's, a, it's got to be shaken up. And it's got to be shaken up in a way that allows people to recognize that what we had in the past just wasn't good enough. Well, some, some of the editors I spoke to, um, they said that the emerging professional, professionals, so the younger journalists who are coming into their newsrooms are actually starting to change stuff a bit because they're talking about these things. 
Um, and one of the editors told me, like, I got a, a new runner, and after a week, she came into my office. She was like, okay, let's debrief. And I'm looking at her like, we're going to what? <laughs> like, I want to talk about how my, how my week went, and I want some feedback. But it, it, so it's, some of these things are being driven by the younger generation who has a different view of how newsrooms should be led. And they are kind of, they're making at least some people reconsider. Yeah. So, so on that point about the, the, the debrief, we had um, a new journalist, a new career, early career journalist on one of our workshops. And she was like, I've said to my manager, I want a check-in every fortnight for a specific time. And we were like, whoa, OK. <laughs> and they're like, oh, my manager said yeah. It's like, OK, great. And, and sometimes it takes that younger person or a different type of person to just change. So it's going both ways. It's, it, it's so important what Josh said about managed leads from the top. But unless we kind of have the two-way conversation, it ain't going to work. And I think that that's why it's so important what we're doing in J schools. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if we are from the start initiating these conversations, um, and not just saying, oh, journalism is brilliant. I do think it's brilliant, but they, everybody needs to be prepared for what might happen once they get in the field. Um, but another thing I wanted to mention on the note of uh, supervisors in particular, they got a lot of slack today, and I think a lot of that was deserved. Um, but if we are moving, and I hope we are, into an era where supervisors, line managers would be better equipped to recognize that something is going on, offer support, um, create those spaces, then we have to also recognize that this is labor. So they should have support in developing these skills. They should have the time in their schedules for debriefings, for briefings, and this should be recognized as labor. It's not something that they do after work, going to a pub or a cafe or somewhere, because a lot of, and, and that's still work. So it should be, my point, it should be recognized, it should be supported, their skills should be supported, and it should be remunerated. The enemy of every newsroom is that thing on the wall behind you, the clock. When do you do these things? Because when people finish their shift, or their deadline, or their bulletin, TV, radio, news, they all want to go. If you do it in the morning, that's when everyone's starting up what stories they need to cover for the day. Do you do it at lunch? Well, people are eating or trying to grab a sandwich for five minutes because their manager's got them doing a story that's... Who eats? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I never ate before news. Um, There's no time. <laughs> so, again, it needs to be structured and it needs to be a cultural change when, when these things happen. You know, it's just, it's, it's just like, it's like trying to turn around the Titanic at the last minute when you know there's an iceberg dead ahead. Yes, Ke Kevin, is it? Uh, managers know... News managers know how to get the news out because it's, it is driven by uh, time. And that's why they got promoted. Yes. And they're trained how to manage news. They're not trained how to manage people. And that, that's our argument, that's I think, manager. today. They're trained how to manipulate people. No, well, that's, <laughs> but that's not training how to manage people. And good, good, good resource management is actually looking after people's care. Yeah. And if you look after people's care, they, it's team building, it, it's also being aware that you're overexposing some journalists to tr too much trauma and rotating people. So mm -hmm. it's using your resources in a more effective way, but they're not, they're not trained to do that. They're trained to get the news out, and therefore their priority is the clock at the wall, as he says. And, and then they get a good news dead. You know, was that bullet what it was supposed to be? Was that you paper what it was supposed to be? But was it they don't see the aftermath of getting that paper out or getting that broadcast? The way they do it is remove the people from the newsroom. Have a little away day somewhere, the team building things, which are great because training people can be more approachable outside the newsroom environment. So you take them away in one of those little, you know, not obstacle course and such, but those problem solving things, it's even a bit like... Escape room. But yeah. Escape well, the whatever, newsroom. Yeah, whatever, whatever works, you know, as a team building thing. People are more likely to talk away from the work environment. Get them somewhere else and then you can you can actually build a dialogue there. And people who don't normally speak to each other in the newsroom because they sit, he sits there and he sits there and they don't talk and it's even in the canteen occasionally. 
start a relationship in terms of communication. And I think that's important as well, that sometimes it will cost money, so we will only know about getting But for every money. one pound, we get 520 Absolutely, back. Yeah, ka -ching. More for the king. I mean, for next, sorry. I mean, we came to the staff. Yeah. I mean, the through yeah. the staff, you put people on a too much pressure, give them staff. You see yeah. how many people here? Yeah. Experience. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. just, it's, it's a no brainer, isn't it? Yeah. Like, it's a okay, it's about people trauma. Yeah. Retire people. You don't deal with it, you retire them. Well, yes? I was just going to just cover it quickly. You know, one thing that has to be transformed, I suppose, is to manage themselves. I mean, you can have other people within the newsroom who you might talk to or outside the organisation and so forth, but it's about giving managers the skills to, to be people persons and, and to manage people and to manage human resource. Um, and just an observation on it is um, I've been on the board of the National Council of Training Firms for a number of years, and about seven years ago, I proposed a new management training system for journalists, for you know, middle managers. and all this material that we're talking about here was kind of included in that and got, let us say, a bit of pushback <laughs> from the other man together. Are those the who needs to be on board <laughs> question? Yeah, but but, but the, the good news is this, um, you know, they have come on board and, and they have accepted and they've got you know, over a million pound investment in the Journalism Skills Academy uh, and as part of that, a new management leadership training course is now being developed and we actually have complete, like, in fact, the enthusiasm that's coming from the other editors on the board is a complete turnabout. You know, all the things that they were opposed to five years ago are sitting there and without going outside of this room, I think one of the big factors in this is that um, when they were recruiting always, there was always, you know, maybe 20, 30 applications, if not more, uh, but particularly after COVID, there was a big shortage and there was actually a big exodus from, exodus from the newsrooms. And these were hard nosed managing editors and they were completely shocked by this. This absolutely blew their mind that they would have a staff shortage and that they would not find the advertising post, they would not have 20 or 30 people looking to take it over and some of the most experienced reporters just walked out of the newsroom. Yeah. And this completely made them sit back and think, well, what's going on here and, and what do we need to do to change this? And I think that, that has had, you know, that shock <laughs> that came to them. They're the ones now talking about we really get this management leadership program up and running quickly, get it mm -hmm. done, get it out of the way, get it done, we need to do this, we need to do that, what do we need to do in it? You know, it's almost like a, a, a total reversal of the thing, where they've actually realised that, you know, all the things that they were doing wrong, that they needed to change around. And the other thing is, you know, because you have more competition for those journalism skills, um, you know, with, with the new marketing and, you know, what, whatever you want, like to call those roles, but, you know, they're offering maybe you know, the salary they're offering, and I thought 12 plus they're offering, you know, maybe 30 percent more salary, you know, and that really has changed their mindset, you know, and it's that kind of, when they actually realise, but, you know, I suppose the mentality is, if you have a queue of people to get into your newsroom, you think, well, what's the problem here? You know, there's, there's a lot of problems, um, but it's only when that shot came that that, that mm -hmm. So, you know, the good news is, you make more money on TikTok. Yeah, exactly. You know, and, and, and when they've seen that, and, and the other thing is that the, the, the certainties have gone. You know, so you go back, you know, twenty years, thirty years, a lot of when when they were training. You know, there was certainties there about what the future was going to look like. You know, you were still going to produce your paper. You're still going to have whatever. You know, all those certainties are going out the door. You have to you have to have agile leadership now within the newsroom. And um, they they know now that it's not the technology. It's not printing press, it's not your marketing, the key thing is having good editorial content uh, and that's whether what your whatever platform you're on, it doesn't make a difference. You know, if you've got good editorial content and to get that good editorial content you need good people and you need to attract in the very best people, you know, and it's just that that again is kind of that realization that, that that's where, where they have mm -hmm. to be. But to to retain people and again that was a problem in the past and to retain people wasn't so much of a problem but um you know particularly I think since you know, during the pandemic, reach were kind of basically grabbing all the reporters from, from different newsrooms because they were beefing up their digital first operations and, and launching new products and so forth. And they were just snapping up the top reporters uh, from their newsrooms. And that, that again had a big effect. But again, it's that because they're realizing that if the, the future isn't certain, well, you, they have to equip themselves with leadership skills and properly manage. Mm -hmm. You know, their their biggest resource, which is the people that they actually have, um, 
and that they can't just rely upon them. That's what other people are always going to be you know, waiting to, to take take over from those people. So the good news is, as I said, that that journalism skills gap is up and running. It's not fair. It's not perfect, but you know the money is going into it, uh, and the key component of that is just the kind of leadership development program that they are all buying into. Mm -hmm. It's not, as I said, it's for, for other reasons, not 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 for the reasons that they're doing it, but it's being forced kind of where they realize that the. the it's great it's great that it's now part of the leadership training but then the next step is actually giving the space and the time in work programs of these leaders to actually put all of their skills in practice because as was mentioned you know if you have a deadline and nowadays deadline is the online deadline which is a minute after something happens or shorter it is likely that that will be prioritized so kind of carving out time and making it very clear what is in their remit of, of each line manager, kind of th that is really important. Just one other point that, like, that they make me, um, which is a strange point, is that, um, let's say as well, one of the things that I've noticed is that the, the, the workforce coming in would have almost seen their job as a vocation, you know, so they were working any hours, didn't matter, weekends, whatever, track the news on the time off, come in on their days off, skip holidays and whatever, um, because they just saw it as almost a vocation, they didn't see it as being you know, a profession you know, or, or a job if it's a vocation. And I suppose newsrooms would have played upon that, you know, they would have played upon that. that, that the passion that. economy. Yes, yeah. but, you know, the fact that they, they, they people saw it as a vocation. But now, the, you know, the common fact from a, a lot of them is when somebody turns around and leaves, you know, be a very experienced reporter and they're there for 10, 15 years and they go for a bigger salary, but they go to maybe a um, social media marketing company. These editors are completely shocked with that because they're thinking, I thought this person was, you know, th th this was their vocation in life, but suddenly they're gone off and they're not even wanting to work in the newsroom proper, you know. And again, that kind of has shocked them a bit, you know, that, that, that people would do that and they would they, they would be looking for jobs that are more nine to five and mm -hmm. kind of completely fit around that they're not really owned by the newsrooms. And I think that's you know, that 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 that's feedback that's come from them as well. So um, and, and I think a lot of that comes back to just acknowledging that on an everyday basis, even if you're not dealing with trauma on that day, journalism is hard and a lot of a lot of this is expected of journalists. And that was touched upon in these uh, interviews as well. And a couple of journalists said that um, those who exit journalism usually go into PR or marketing or kind of wider communications. But rarely people very openly say, I'm, I'm sick and tired of working for 24 seven, because that is by some perceived as, oh, well, you're not cut out to be a journalist. You know, you have to be able to tough it out for 24 seven. And also kind of, kind of that, the exit interviews in which journalists are trying to hide, well, you know, that's emotional labor. They're trying to hide the fact that they are leaving because they want a job that doesn't require 24 seven from them or doesn't require them to watch, you know, children dying or bombs exploding. If we have that conversation and, you know, we acknowledge that all of these things is happening. Now, if somebody doesn't want to watch kids die, why wouldn't they leave? You know, why, why would that be seen as, you know, not toughing it, it up? So kind of what Hannah is doing with headlines and what Leona is doing with uh, trauma in, in the newsroom, it's all about kind of normalizing this conversation. And that's one of the reasons why I'm really happy to be here today, because it's, like I know Lana said at the beginning, sometimes it's like speaking to an empty room and you know that people actually care about it, but they don't want to be seen sitting in the room. But kind of the more we talk about it, the more people will come and kind of more... I'm hoping that in the industry, kind of being emotional, being human will, will become something which is legit which is okay you know we can feel we're humans yes this upset me and now i'm gonna deal with it by i don't know speaking to my colleagues or going for a run or just sitting and thinking and reflecting about it until i find a perspective from which i can deal with this i personally won't see david blevins cry when he's asking do you feel the same question 
Well, politicians can cry in those situations as well. Um, I'm very happy to continue this conversation afterwards. But I'm going to leave it at that because I'm aware of the time and we still need to, we still have one presentation left. So thank you for listening. Thank you for sharing.